Uh, we, are, we are in Ninth Lit, and we're talking about part two of uh, uh, Peace Child. And we just took a quiz. And what I was going to say is we do this a lot in AP literature. You know, the, because we're classical, that's one of the chief ways that we learn and handle material. We have classroom discussions. And uh, we, we had one Friday or Thursday. There are 15 people in there. And we, everybody said these really neat things. Like, you know, 13 people had really interesting things to say. And uh, nobody repeated it. You know, said Johnny said what I was going to say. You know, none of that. And so I came to the last two people. I'm thinking, you know, what in the world could they possibly add to this discussion? And I, I, I noted it that both of them said something different and interesting. I know you're only in the ninth grade. They're in the 11th grade. They should be able to do that. Um, but when as we get ready to do that, you wanted to be first, and we'll go to uh, Sean. But um, if you're the last person, you should be thinking, OK, I've still got to say something. Think about how challenging it is. got to say something different than all the 14 people ahead of me said. Uh, and that, that's actually one good thing about this process, because you know, you, you, it's, you don't want to say the obvious thing. Uh, you want to say something in, different and interesting. So it's, it's challenging. So uh, we'll go to Sean and see what interesting thing he has to say. Come on. Uh, go ahead. I thought it was interesting how, like, uh, Richardson went to this place with, like, this, cra like, I don't want to say crazy, but, like, different people. I, like, we were really scared to do something like that. What did you say? What's the first thing you said about all that? You thought yeah, it was how, what? It was interesting how Richardson would like be not like I don't know, scared to like go. Okay. Well, how do you explain that? It happened, and so how do you explain? But it? he wanted to like spread the gospel and like get other people. Well, how do, how do you explain that? I mean, why would somebody want to do that? Why would anybody be so excited about something? Um, I mean, think about the most exciting thing in your life that you love to do all the time. <coughs> I don't know what that would be. Let's say play video games. You can play video games 24 hours if this were possible. You just have to do it in New Guinea where there are headhunters and alligators and crocodiles and snakes. And they might kill you and eat you, but you can play video games there. Um, think about that. Think about doing the most exciting thing in the world. There. You wouldn't even want to do that. But here they're doing something, you know, that, I mean, how many people do you know are that excited about the gospel? For, to begin, go to church on Sunday. Let's spend an hour in church on Sunday listening to the gospel, you know, you're at church. But these people, they go to the most dangerous place on earth and challenge these people with the gospel, and they could be killed for it. You know, we talk about martyrs with murder in cathedral. I, I just, what I'm getting at is you're seeing a love of, for God that's not as unusual as you think it is. People love God enough to do that. These aren't the only missionaries that ever lived. Um, and so I, I, I guess one of the things by reading the book, I hope that you understand there are people that love God that much. And you know, well, that's good for them. That's not my thing. Um, but if, if you know what the gospel says, it's, it's, you know, if you're either in or you're either out. Doesn't mean we're all going to be gospel New Guinea missionaries. Uh, we don't need that. But the, the thing that all Christians should have in com common is this burning love for him and the willing to serve him. So to me, that's the most interesting thing about what you said is that these people are willing to put their lives in danger because they love God. They didn't have to do it. Nobody put a gun to their head and said they had to do it. They wanted to do it. I doubt if you want to do it. I, that's not what, I don't think God's called on me. I don't want to go there. I, that's not really my gift. But do, I, do we love God enough to do what he calls us to do, whatever that is? Ben. Um, so I thought it was interesting, like, when we think of, like, the moat today, we just think of, like, no, um, no technology and stuff. But, like, like, the one part where he, like, the kerosene lamp, like, they had, like, I'm sure they had, like, fire and stuff, but, like, he liked Lamp, like, the kerosene lamp, like, 
Yeah, and, and at the same time, notice how much, how much like us they are. You know, they're, they're so different from us. But in, think about it in some really superficial ways. Uh, when you take away all the technology, that's not even who we are. We're not, we're not who we are because of our technology and our comfort. They are not who they are just because they lack that. We, we are just like them in a lot of ways. That's, that's the remarkable thing. Yeah, every time I read that part, I'm astonished because I actually have had have two children, and we have three grandchildren. And can you imagine giving one away, particularly if you had you didn't have but one? Um, and they they respect that. They respect that they be exchanged. Like that that's a rule. The rule is <coughs> to betray people. <laughs> but these same people have this other rule. If you give me a child, I won't betray you. I wonder why they even keep that rule. You know what I mean? I mean, if you're going to break these fundamental rules, do you not have any rules uh, at all? Sorry. Uh, I thought it was interesting how, like, when they first got <coughs> there, and they're, they're like really violent people and stuff, and how God really like helps the missionaries by like um, knowing that they should trade gifts with them to keep them calm. And Do anything you got to say, but he, he always gave God credit for these three guys. You know, he sent these three guys out here. Like that was the will of God, and th those are the three that were the first three that they kind of related to and had experiences with. And so they could see God working um, in every aspect of their lives. Yes, Sarah. Um, I thought it was fascinating when, um, when they were doing the exchanging of the good child, um, John asked him. If it was necessary to have a good child, and the mm -hmm. were like looking at him as being crazy because, and he said that the Trinity must not have war then because he needed a good child to have peace. So they couldn't possibly, like, it's interesting to see how John, the cultural difference between John doesn't understand it, but the Saudis think don't understand how he couldn't have a good child. That's a good point. He couldn't understand them, but they couldn't understand him. I mean, it, it, was a, it was a lack of understanding on both parts. Uh, they were just as astonished at some of the things he did. Remember, they thought he was a god at first, um, and, and, as he was of what they were doing. Yeah, really. I thought it was really interesting how, like, when, well, really good point. You can't even talk to them, right? You have to gesture, you have to point, you have to, I mean, think how exhausting that is just to get, um, we have somebody at our house who is uh, 96 years old and he doesn't hear very well. And it's exhausting to talk. We realize that if, I, if he says something to me, I can hear him. But if I say something to him, he can't hear me. And so I have to make I have to go to a lot of effort just to get some things across. I have to say it three or four times. I have to point. I have to gesture. You know, it's literally like another language, and that's exhausting. And you wonder what a what a missionary does. They get does he get up at eight o'clock and go to Caldwell and work all day and come home and eat supper and watch TV and go to bed. That's kind of my life. Um, what does a, what does a missionary do? What's like the uh, what's like the job description? Like what do you do at eight? What do you do at ten? What do you do at noon? Um, well, think how busy they are. I mean, incredibly busy. Just that alone is, is a tremendous thing to try to figure out what do these words mean. i got to think of a language. I, I think it's astonishing. That, to me, astonishes me as much as anything in the book, really, is coming up with a language. How do you, how do you, do you they have the language. You just have to figure out what it means and then might make words out of it. You know, I mean, written words. Did you have something? Sorry. All right. Uh, anybody over here, I don't want to take him, him for him, we go to Luke. Uh, I thought after Tuan overheard Emma, like, threaten him to make a deal with Sali that they would, like, leave each other alone, I thought that was interesting how right after that, um, Tuan tried to make peace with the, uh, Hanan men and the Kamar after they were, um, like, didn't have peace together until, like, they tried to 
how they attack them, right? Well, like how to like have like cases and stuff as well, drugs. They, so what is the point of making? Uh, I just thought it was interesting how right after that he was threatened, he tried to make peace. Um, okay, why did you find that interesting? What was it about that that's interesting to you? Just how it like they got threatened and right after that they were trying to make like a, a difference between them. So. Well, that makes sense to me. I mean, I'd want to make with peace with somebody who was threatening me. I wouldn't want to be. That's your point, but I, I'm just trying to figure out what it is that is so interesting about that. Well, why? kill somebody, you take their name. <clears throat> well, when you make peace with somebody, you take their name, too. Um, they, they begin to be, if, what, if I took, if you took each other's name, what, what would that, that would seem like a, why would you do something? What does that mean if you take somebody else's name? Like, I'm named after my father. Okay, I took my father's name. My dad gave me his name, and I gave my name to my mother. My son, a different name, he gave his name to his son. So what? that's one of the most honored things you could do, right? If you give your name to somebody, or if you take, I want to be named after somebody, that's like the highest honor. I want the name of somebody saying, what do you think? Well, you and your sister have this, you don't have the same first name. But you have same last name. I mean, and that gives you the right to live in the same home. You have the same parents, but it's all symbolized by that last name. And when you know, when I look on the the carpool list in the afternoon, I see Powell. Um, I think it's the only Powell in the school. There was a Powell last year. I don't know if he's still back down there, but I see Powell. My my antenna goes up because I identify that. I'm bound to my children for a lot of reasons, and we symbolize that by having the same name. Um, so you're right, that's a good way to put it. It's a binding or bonding thing, yeah. Um, I think it's hard to believe that Jesus would be thought of the hero of the story, and it just shows you how corrupt their culture was and how like twisted their mindset was. So I think it was also helpful to um, John because Um, <clears throat> yeah, um, elaborate on that just a minute. Um, well, I mean, he now knows that they're, like, they have this whole culture or, like, this thing where they'll, like, have a friend and they'll pretend to be their friend so they can't, like, end up killing them. And it made him, like, think of just what they did to us, but it also helped him to find peace again with them. You're like in the worst, absolute worst fear. I can't think of a situation worse. If you can't trust anybody, and if they don't like you, they're going to kill you and eat you. I, I, you think, like you said earlier, about how these people went to these places, and that was interesting. To me, it's like, you ever realize that the worst your life gets is actually the opportunity to be closer to God? We talk about that in our, our house, about low points. You know, like, okay, this is about it. This is about the bad worst it's ever been, like, whatever. You know, this is about, we're at the lowest point. You know, we can't find anything good <coughs> or hopeful. And it's almost like, okay, you kind of get excited because it can't get any worse. That means God is going to come through. Um, to me, that's, that's something I've learned as a Christian for 50 years, is that when it gets really, really bad, I kind of get excited because there's only one way to go, and that's up. And God, and that's just not a platitude uh, expression. That's the truth. God will intervene. Daniel, we got we got five minutes for everybody else to say something. Um, I guess. Well, um, one of the things that I found was really interesting is that I mean, it was it was pretty much like a miracle that they were able to have three tribes like live together and like all in the same area and not just be where they had fighting and stuff and live 
David Richardson to be an MVP for that long, regardless of different tribe. Yeah, I said, ironically, <coughs> the coming of of um, the Richardsons created the fighting because now that he's there, they all want to be around him, and because they're around him, they hate each other and they start fighting. Before he came, they lived separately. And he figured out that's why they've been able to survive because they simply don't live around the people that they hate. Uh, and yet his coming has brought that Charlotte. Um, I'm not an Anglican, I'm a faith. Like, women have, they're like everybody's kind of God because they have young babies and living with like around people that were like super dangerous. And like they were thrown under his face with like those cannibals and those like young children. And like, I don't know, I think it's just hard. Yeah, that's the uh, ladies, since you talk about particularly the ladies, that's the person, or guys, maybe I should, that's the person you want to marry. Somebody who's willing to go wherever you want to go and vice versa. Mm -hmm. You know, that y'all are literally on the same page about what your life is. If you have different views of where, how you want to live, where you want to go, that's probably not going to work. But you want to be married to somebody who, yeah, we're one. We, we think about it. We, you change it, the, the, our culture, still has it so that the woman changes her name, right? You're talking about exchanging names. <coughs> when the woman marries the man, they're complete strangers. Did you know I married a complete stranger? I mean, I, I married a, a woman 45 years ago, my wife. I'd never seen her in my life. It's kind of a silly state because, of course, you marry people you're not related to. You don't marry people you're related to. But at the same time, she... She's a complete stranger. And yet I've lived with her for 45 years. And she took my name. She put her name away and exchanged her name for my name. We didn't exchange it, but gave up her name for my name. She's now, for 45 years, carried my name, Powell. Um, talking about bonds, a bond, you know, that's sort of the same thing, isn't it? Of exchanging names, blue or. Uh, I found it interesting how Yeah, I've got more tomorrow. That was one of the things I was going to bring up tomorrow, that uh, the, the, the parents were happy when their children talked back to them. <clears throat> their parents were happy when their children were so obstinate and uh, intractable, you know, unmanageable. All right, I'm, that's my son. I'm proud of him. That's, that's absurd. Um, we wouldn't say that, but they do because they want their children to grow up like that. Um, Libby. Oh, they were talking about the uh, other missionaries that went over there. So what, yeah, go ahead. That's a really good point. What is your point about Sam? I just thought, I just thought it was, I mean, I thought it was cool how they. So what, what conclusion can you draw? This would be the last thing we can say, is that even before they, you asked why did they go, there's already evidence <coughs> that God was working. There's already evidence that God was changing these people, that even these Sawis could come to know Jesus. Now, they weren't the very, very first people to go there. Not to these people they were. The Sawis had never been mission, you know, been evangelized before. But New Guinea had, and people had come to know Jesus by the thousands. That, that, that should encourage you. Think about Paul. Nobody ever heard of Jesus in Greece. You know, about when Paul got there, he was literally the first person to tell them about Jesus, but not, not us. There are people, even in New Guinea, in 1961, who knew about Jesus. Yeah. Is New Guinea considered, like, a Christian country now? Um, that is a great question. You know what I'd say? I'd say it's probably a Muslim country, if anything, but I don't know that either. I have no idea. That's a very good question. I will look that up. Good job. Um, we will do this at the beginning of class tomorrow afternoon. And uh, then we go to the prologue. Uh, but, but there's a little more we need to talk. The big section. I will get your quizzes. I'm, I will have those to you tomorrow. Okay. What is Peace Child 3? Oh, Peace Child 3. I like that. Sounds like the trick, the sequel, right? Uh,
right now it's going to be due a week from today. It's a week from today, and we'll, I, I, that's, I'm always flexible with that. One week, okay, work on Chief Cal 3.